Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Dr. David Eckert. He has an impressive professional resume, but he likely would identify himself first and foremost as Emeritus Professor of Sociology and Gerontology at the University of Kansas. For the last 20 years, Dr. Eckert has conducted critical research on workers' changing experience of retirement and on the ways that people manage and dispose of their possessions in later life. He is the author of the book, Downsizing, Confronting Our Possessions in Later Life. In addition to this book, Dr. Eckert is the author or co-author of over 100 articles, chapters, reviews, editorials, and edited books on aging-related themes. Dr. Eckert most recently authored an article in the Wall Street Journal, I Spent 44 Years Studying Retirement, Then I Retired, published last October. Dr. Eckert is also editor-in-chief of the highly regarded Macmillan Encyclopedia on Aging, an expansive four-volume work that covers topics in biology, healthcare, social and behavioral sciences, humanities, ethics, and social policy, all related to the field of aging. In 2018, Dr. Eckert served as pre president of the Gerontological Society of America, the oldest and largest interdisciplinary organization devoted to research, education, and practice in the field of aging. Dr. Eckert earned his doctorate at Boston University and has also been a member of the faculties of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and the Boston University School of Public Health. Please welcome Dr. David Eckert to NASM today. Hello, Dr. Eckert. How are you? I'm fine, Mary Kay. It's good to see you. You know, in preparation for our conversation this morning, I went back into the abyss, meaning my email inbox, and I found our very first email exchange. And it was in the summer of 2009. Wow. Um, I had written to you. Yeah. Did you not? Is that surprising to you? Yeah. Um, August 2009, I was inviting you to speak at the 2010 NASM conference in Las Vegas. And you said yes, and we became fast friends after a uh, meeting face to face at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. But um, seriously, we were delighted um, to meet you. We, um, someone with your impeccable academic credentials who chose to conduct research in the same general space as our young, little known um, field of senior move management, helping older adults downsize, declutter, and transition to a new living environment in later life. Um, it was just uh, so exciting to meet you. And in 2009, 2010, there was very little awareness, um, not much activity in this space at all. So it begs me to ask the question, what prompted you to begin the study of uh, you know downsizing in later life. Well, I was I was moving on. I thought from studying the, an earlier transition that's common in later life, which is retirement. Moving on to thinking about the next thing, which would be people making residential choices and moving. And eventually, I centered on well on this idea that um, in order to do that, people need to deal with um, the things that they've accumulated over their lives. But another, <clears throat> I think I was part of a group that wants to start talking about the material dimension of aging. Those of us in my field, we like to talk about intangibles, track people's health, track their roles, track their emotions. And we wanna raise our hand and say the material that people live among that they see and they touch and that they smell every day, um, this has a big effect on the way that their aging process goes. And for example, there's an entire part of our, of our group, a materiality group that studies clothing in later life. And especially how women uh, manage, use, manage their aging with clothing, uh, selecting different styles to present themselves in a, in a positive way. Um, and also grooming, there's now studies of, of uh, uh, hair salons and what women are doing in a hair salon. Um, again, talking about the, you know, the material or bodily parts of aging, uh, less so than the, uh, than the, uh, um, uh, the, things that, the, the things that we can't touch or see. We think the things that we can touch and see are really important to, the, uh, to a good quality of life. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, circling back to our first email exchange, um, how that came about is we were sent an article that you authored for another publication that the um, University of Kansas alumni magazine, the Rock Chalk Review, reprinted. Does that ring a bell? In the article, you state that downsizing and decluttering are hard because it's nothing less than an encounter with ourselves. Our stuff represents who we were, who we are, and who we're going to be. I love this thought, and it appears to be the foundation of pretty much all of your work around downsizing. Can you expand on this a little bit more? Well, we're continually pushing through the years, trying to understand where we are in life, and, and also not, not necessarily accepting where we are in life, and often resisting where we are in life, and who am I going to be, and what's going to become of me, and how long am I going to be in the situation that I'm in? And I'm far more interested in, in people, how people reflect on their time moving through life. I don't know if it's, if it's um, heresy to say this. I care less about the things. I, I know the things are involved and the things are central, but it's really people's relationship to things that has been um, the fascinating thing for me. And the way that things now seem to be confronting us in later life. For sure. I, you know, and I get the whole part of who we were and who we are. Interesting about the whole, and I think you take it um, a step further with the who we're going to be. So basically, if we're downsizing, we're also determining who we're going to be by what we keep. Is that, is that where you're going with that? Or we have changed our mind about who we are and now we can release something. So we, I mean, a lot of our research, if I want to study people's relationship to things, it's pretty vague thing to do. You just don't show up at somebody's house and say, well, talk to me about your belongings here. Um, we did it in this situation of people moving, um, especially people about to move who had moved. And um, that's really an intense period. So we could get a lot of information out of an intense period like that. And um, where was I going? Oh, I was where I, we were talking about who we're going to be. Like, who we're, it's, yeah, it's, who, we're going, it's, who we're going to be. And yeah. how, do people, how do people get around to releasing things that they've kept, in especially in a short period of time? And we distilled some uh, um, mental uh, shortcuts that people take, you call them heuristics or protocols or scripts, and there's about a half a dozen of them. In other words, what will fit? That, that's an inflexible thing. Right. You can't take the thing if it won't fit. Um, and one of the things was me and not me is a heuristic. So me things narrate my life, not me things are things that I can now get rid of because they have no more use or no more symbolic or emotional uh, value to me. And this is a really interesting uh, phenomenon that we observed. Women, for example, there were about four or five women had, and they were widowed, had moved to, I think, uh, a retirement community or assisted living, and they had released their dining materials. And now we're in their new place. They kept, they talked about having a set of dishes. I had a full set of dishes or I had my everyday dishes and my holiday dishes. And they talked about having uh, now reduced themselves to a service for four or a service for six. It's either always a service for four or a <laughs> yeah. service for six. So they're measuring the size of their new life by the number of um, plates that they take along. And it doesn't, it's not a defeat for them, it's actually, set as a sort of a, a, an achievement. Look at, this is all I need now. They have decided who they are going to be. And so this is going to be sufficient. Oh, and the same is true with clothing. Um, people decide who they're going to be uh, from the experience of dealing with that as well. Right, and you know, when you're talking about the place settings of four and six, you know, I imagine that's sort of the natural transition in life where you know, just like we hand off things from one generation to the next, we also hand off the social amenities. You know, a lot of people who have children, it's now the next generation's turn to host the Thanksgiving 
the Christmas, the Easter, so that um, the person in assisted living really has no need for anything more than four or six because it's always just, you know, a dinner or whatever, you know, a brunch. People, uh, there's an anecdote in the book about, you know, in, under this heading of me and not me, that a woman was getting rid of, rid of her dining room table. And she said, I had the pads, I had the extensions, I had everything, I had the tablecloths. She tried to sell it and she couldn't. So she was going to give it to a daughter of a friend of hers. And she recounted how her husband was extremely upset that she was going to do that. He said, we're not going to be able to entertain anymore. We're not going to have things at our house anymore. And she couldn't understand. She went on at great length. Why was he so upset? She said, now my daughters, like, as you just said, my daughters, uh, they cook and they put the food out on the counter and everybody just eats and they're working. And she said, and I'm supposed to set up crystal goblets and <laughs> yeah. linen. I'm supposed to do that. I am done. I am not entertaining anymore. I'm not hosting these big, but her husband was still upset about her giving the table away. And it's also an example of what, hap what happens when you have two people in the house and they diverge on what should befall certain kinds of possessions. Well, interesting too, was that, did he feel like he was giving his patriarchy away <clears throat> to a certain extent, you know? I, 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 I think you might infer that. Um, <laughs> no, she, I mean, and you know, women of, of a certain time and of a certain generation, um, we're given their femininity and we're giving their domesticity by having all of these materials. Somebody in my department at the University of Kansas wrote a book on 17 magazine in the years in the 1950s and the 1960s, examining what went on. And teenage girls in the post-war years were encouraged by 17 magazine to pick out your uh, China pattern yeah. and pick out your silver pattern and pick out your linens and what do you want for your flatware? They weren't, I mean, that was what you were aspiring to be. You were supposed to load yourself up with these things and make yourself presentable to be a woman in marriage. It was, it's rather astonishing. Well, that isn't done anymore. Um, I don't think that's the content of 17 Magazine, but they, were, but, but, but they were trained and raised and also by the encouragement of their mothers and grandmothers uh, models to, I have I believe the same thing. I plead guilty to all of the above. And um, I'm married 44 years this year. And yes, I have, you know, my Lenox China in the little quilted, you know, wrappers in the in our storage space in our yeah, house, in our attic. Yeah. <laughs> Never used it, not ever, not once, but I have three daughters and nobody wants it. So we'll see. Yeah. Another thing is when we met face to face in Las Vegas in 2010, I discovered you were not a true believer in the professional role of senior move managers back then. If I recall correctly, your research was indicating that most older adults wanted to downsize themselves or with some assistance from family members. What are your thoughts now as the professional field of senior move management has grown beyond anyone's wildest imagination? The total volume of older adult downsizing and move jobs last year likely exceeded in our universe of $350 million. And that's not counting a lot of people who might be doing this more informally than our members who are part of a professional trade association. What are your thoughts now? Well, you've got this large cohort now is, is arriving into their 60s and even into their 70s now. They're more affluent than people might have been 20 years ago. Their children are also probably more affluent um, than it was true in 2010. Um, more money is being uh, uh, devoted to this. People have tended to see, the ones that we interviewed tended to see moving as a do-it-yourself activity. They'd always moved, them, moved themselves. Why couldn't they do this as well? And it might've taken a few years to see the benefit of hiring somebody to do this. Although people will say, yeah, but you have to pay for that. And it's like, yes, you do. <laughs> um, but there's such a, but there's, you have such a variety of way of serving people now 
um, that that you're not along for the whole. You can you can consult. You can number of hours. You you'll absorb the whole job. I think it's an evolution of of uh, the senior move profession that uh, that has become more common. We had oh, out of the 130 households we talked to, we had half a dozen perhaps had hired someone to help them in this way, and they were very satisfied with it. Right. And that was, what years would you say that was? That was at this time. Yeah, at this time. Yeah. Um, but pe people do not want to spend money. Um, right. they, they don't want to spend money on estate sellers and they don't want to spend money. Um, and they don't want to uh, potentially lose money by turning things over an auctioneer. Um, they don't want to pay a mover any more than they have to. I mean, their, their sort of frugality continues right on through this. Yeah, for sure. And um, one thing that has evolved, I think, is the perception of senior move management as sort of an affluent or elitist service. Um, because, you know, our members day in and day out largely are helping people of pretty moderate circumstance. Because the, you know, the point is, you can sort of have a hybrid situation where you do do some of it yourself. Yeah. You do have some family assistance. And then also for more, the more daunting aspects of it, you can hire a senior move manager. So it's not that all or nothing thing that maybe was the perception by the consumer public you know, years earlier. I think we've done a, a pretty good job of getting that message out that it's, it's a menu of services. And so then it can fit almost any budget. Yes, and I, I know so many people that are prisoners of their stuff. They're content, they're contemporaries of mine. They shouldn't really be in that house anymore. But I don't. They can't can possibly conceive of what they're going to do to get themselves out of it. And I tell them, you know, you can you can invite someone in to talk for, to talk with you. You would have an attorney draw up a a trust for you, and you would have an electrician come and do something about that flickering fan. But at the same time, there's professional opinion that about what roads you might take and my, what routes you might take and how my, this long this might take. So I have, I have talked up the uh, senior move managers. Well, thank you so much. Another line in your book that struck me as so rich with truth was, and this is from my personal and professional experience, is um, this line. One thing that downsizers discover is the accustomed meaning of many, many things actually fades. Let's talk about this. While it's seemingly true, why do so many people still feel pain over separating themselves from basic things? Not cherished mementos, but everyday things. For example, um, our senior move managers might be helping a client downsize and declutter and they discover eight spatulas in the kitchen tool drawer. Why did that happen? How did that happen? And why is it so hard to give seven of those to goodwill? I const you know, we have a, a set of motives that we talk about for why people keep acquire things and keep things and value things. And one of the one of them is conservation is a virtue. I don't exactly know where it comes from, but um, it's been observed in studies of household management, for example, in England, that nobody throws anything away or releases anything that could possibly be of value to someone else, even if you don't know who that other person is. The, the, the poor children in some part of the world could really <laughs> use those National Geographics, but you have no idea how to get them to National Geographics. Um, it just conservation is a value. People will not throw anything away unless it is really useless. I, and I'm not sure that's frugality born of the depression. A lot of people say, well, they came through the depression and all and the war. And so they keep everything. Um, we have no way of knowing whether that's actually correct. I think it's a deep human trait to retain things that are still useful. You buy a new microwave and you put the old microwave on the shelf in the garage and there it's going to be uh, years from now. And um, that's true of a lot of replacement consumption. You keep the old things because, well, you might need it. Right. I think that's so interesting that you talk about sort of upending that um, sort of social construct of depression and, um, you know, World War II, uh, 
scarcity, you know, um, that whole thing. I think that's it. So you're saying that that's basically an urban legend. That's the well, big news. It's there's no way to prove it. There's no yeah. way there's there have been no surveys, for example, of say people over the age of 80. Who, then this is the only people we're talking about anymore over the age of 80. Right. How do they value their things versus 50 year olds or 30 year olds? We, we just don't know. It is something that everybody says. But I'll tell you, the baby boomers and the ones coming up after them, we grew up in a, we, a flagrantly commun, uh, uh, consumer society. And we were encouraged to buy things and acquire things. And honest to God, I don't see it stopping. Have, have you seen anyone get married lately that hasn't signed up on a wedding registry, wanting like eight spatulas or super duper salad bowls? And you know they already have one, a super duper <laughs> salad bowl. But, but as long as they have the chance, they're going to rake in all the merch that they possibly can on a wedding registry. So I don't know if it's slowed down. The trouble is, Mary Kay, there's no way to re reliably survey people's possessions. There's no way to count them. There's no way to get your arms around them. I mean, you might approximate it by the, uh, I don't know, by the, the moving companies might tell you so many square feet of, of, of belongings, but there's really no way to say that men value things more than women value things. Cause like, which things? Right, right. There's just too many things. There's too many things. There's, There's tens of things. tens of. Have you ever heard of a count of of a, a counting of people counting how many things are in a house? Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. Well, have you? Are you aware? I mean, do, do well, you... I've I've seen a few articles about it, but it's 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 insane. I mean, it's the number is ridiculous, and so it yeah, it, it is a lot. Um, they, th these anthropologists in Los Angeles tried it. They counted the visible items. They, pick, they picked out 30 households, mom, dad, and the kids. There had to be four people in the house. And they went around and they counted all the visible items that they could. And the first household that they counted was the living room and two bedrooms, just the visible things. They didn't look in the closet or anything. 2,600 things in just those two rooms. So easily there's tens of thousands of things. 51 things on the average affixed to the size to the sides of refrigerators. Those are things. Wow. Wow. People can put in the chat maybe later how many refrigerator magnets they have. Yeah. If they're listening to this, they can go count them quickly. Um and you know, you were talking about how you don't see any of this changing anytime soon. And I will tell you, we do a lot of, Jennifer and I do a lot of interviews with the media on this topic. And, you know, they want to know where the future is headed. You know, are, is the generation, you know, behind us, Gen X and, uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z and everything. Is this all, you know, are they traveling lighter through life? Um, you make the argument just a few minutes ago, probably not. Um, and it's funny because I do think we're observing that maybe they're um, owning less. They're a little bit more nimble, not quite as way down with, what do they call it? Heavy brown furniture. You know, it's a little more Ikea, a little more breakdownable and put in a box kind of furniture, that kind of stuff. But the onset of Amazon and the, you know, just the perpetual dropping at the front door and Target and Ikea and you name it, you know, um, they, they might be owning different stuff, but are they owning, are they gonna own less stuff? You know, that's, that's the question, I don't know. Another don't example know. is fast fashion where um, um, something goes on the market that you've seen in the, in the magazines or social media and you, you wanna buy these clo this clothing or these shoes. I think the, the you'd have to do a head to head comparison. I think that perhaps let's say talk about people in their 30s, for example, they're less likely to be married these days, they're less likely to have children, but put it head to head with a with a family, a married a couple with two children, do they have less stuff than the married couple of two children with two children um, 20 years ago did? Um, not sure there'd be fewer toys in that house and um, fewer strollers and um, fewer kinds of uh, baby dishes and so on, and fewer kinds of clothes. 
I think as if the, the lifestyle might be conducive to owning fewer things, but a head-to-head -head comparison of the same kind of people, I'd like to see what that showed. Interesting, yeah, for sure. In your book, you talk about how cherished family heirlooms were often described by your study participants as obligations or burdens. And yet they assume outsized importance to those same people in the downsizing process. You call those protected things inalienable, as you describe it. A uh, definition of inalienable is unable to be taken away. Our senior move managers would agree 100% speaking from the experience of working with hundreds and thousands of their own clients. Photographs in particular are singled out here. Why are we so loath to discard these things, to feel burdened by them? Do we consider ourselves torchbearers holding the care and custody of family history from one generation to the next? Well, and anthropologists around the world studying cultures of many different kinds have got an entire uh, literature on the gift, on what gifts mean. And gifts are given not to necessarily to give you an object, but gifts are given to build ties with, with, with people. If I, if I give you something, then you will remember me as that's going on. And you have to be loyal to me, Mary Kay, to keep that um, plant behind you that I gave you. You have to, out of loyalty to me, the plant right over your shoulder I gave you. And so it's, it's about keeping ties and it's about being loyal to people and feeling disloyal. We have, oh, I might be in trouble for saying this, but we have some uh, concrete plaques, for example, in our backyard that we can't get rid of because um, <laughs> somebody gave them to us and they might come to our house and they might see them and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's really about maintaining ties. So it's a, it's a good thing that we do that. Um, but there comes a point where nobody remembers who the ancestors were or why they were or um, it, it mysterious. And you can't, again, these heuristics, you can't take it. It won't fit. Um, and its disposition really is a problem. Is that really when we start seeing heirlooms uh, going by the wayside a little bit, just the sheer practical nature of it won't fit? Is that when there's it's suddenly in our faces we can't do it and then we try to find someone else though right to pass it off to where it might fit yeah it well that my my main point uh, it really about aging and possession is i don't care how much um how many belongings you have um if your house is stuffed to the gills and that makes you happy go for it <laughs> the problem is when you cannot accommodate things anymore when it becomes a problem to accommodate these things, then um, you're going to have to think about divesting. And it does happen in life. Not only it, to continue to accommodate things takes financial resources. People were always talking about the upkeep of their houses, the furnace, the roof, the keeping the snow shoveled. Um, and al also, you know, the worry about insuring things and, um, cleaning things and so on and so forth. The upkeep is, it was, is a real burden. So eventually you cannot accommodate. Oh, it also takes energy and stamina uh, to have things, to lift those Lennox China, to bring that up from the basement or down from the attic. And you don't have that anymore. So there, do, there is a stopping point. Later in the book, when you talk about some of the people you interviewed during your research, you explore whether the divested items, whether through donation, distribution to other family members, um, are ever truly missed after they're gone. You actually say stuff never goes away. Please talk about this a little bit more. Well, stuff never goes away in that I'm talking about in your imagination, um, and right. which, is, which is why people create memory books and they take pictures of things and um, they tell stories of things and they give them to their relatives so they, they'll be protected and everything. But stuff doesn't, I, I think I was talking about more on a recycling or environmental level, is that the, the material really doesn't cease to exist. It just passes into another form and it passes into other hands. It doesn't go away, it goes away from you, but it doesn't go away from the earth. I think that's, right. what, that's oh, what I'm okay, saying. okay. Yeah. I thought you were talking about sort of the the memory, um, because that is an important part of this whole thing. The memory is yeah there forever. 
and and having things it represents us represents other people and just many of our own things are ourselves we're conversing with ourselves when we look at some of our things i look at for example my father's uh coin collection uh, he was a newspaper boy as i was as a young and he and he collected coins and this was in the 1930s so he has coins from the late 19th century a whole shoebox full of them and i keep them and it gives me pleasure to just i don't look at the coins much anymore this gives me pleasure to remind myself that i had such a father right right yeah that's good stuff let's talk about storage storage is like purgatory or a halfway house our senior move managers tell us it can be excellent temporary option for many of their clients but it can be a costly dead end for others as it delays critical decision making at a time when lots of critical decisions are being made. In your book, you say that keeping is keeping and storage is definitely on the side of keeping. Can you talk a little bit more about storage and keeping? Well, as one woman said, um, you put it in, it's, you put some, I, it's the way she said it. She said, nine times out of nine, you put something in a box, you're never gonna look at it again. I don't know why it wasn't 10 times out of 10, but nine times out of nine, <laughs> you're, you're never going to look at it again. So you're putting it in a box down the road in a, in a you store it facility. Um, it, it isn't a solution, it's, it's putting the things. And I think it, there is a value in having temporary storage. Um, uh, perhaps a relative, you know, a relative, you're maybe not on the cusp of moving, but a relative is going to be uh, furnishing a new apartment or getting married or transitioning or somebody's uh, going to need these things but they can't receive them just now so it makes perfect sense but uh, the the costs are uh, enormous and people just sort of forget it. they don't forget about it but they just let it ride and let it ride and he was saying i should clean out the attic someday i mean now you've got an attic down the road at the you store it facility exactly that's exactly right um, do you have any advice for our senior move managers when clients maybe come up with the storage option? And, and, you know, I know our senior move managers, you know, do find value in storage for a temp as a, as a temporary situation, as you say, but um, any advice about how to make sure that it's temporary and how to counsel the client about that? Well, given how penny pinching the people we are that we talk to, I'd start with prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just do well, sort of a little workup of, you know, what the next year would look like. Or like two months. Yeah. yeah. Two months yeah. would cost you this and a yeah. year would cost you that. It's a good idea. Money always works as a, <laughs> as a persuasive argument, right? About five years ago, NASM and senior move management were highlighted in an article in the online magazine about later life called Next Age. Do you remember that? Yes. The title of the article was, Sorry, Nobody Wants Your Parents' Stuff. Yeah. The author of the column, Richard Eisenberg, was deluged with responses for weeks that debated both sides of this argument. Essentially, the article makes the case that value in the 21st century is deeply personal and that often older adults are genuinely disappointed to learn that furniture and other household things that they think have value after a lifetime of care and maintenance by them are not worth anything. You say gifts presume the moral cooperation of others. We've talked about this a little bit before. You mentioned a few reasons in your book. Can you expand on this a little bit more? Well, I think there are good reasons that, that adult children um, don't open their arms to uh, receive things. One is they, they grew up in different, we grew up in different generations, understanding different styles of things. And, and it, it may not be to my taste. Honestly, the stuff could be pretty shabby too, that the elders are trying to give away. And uh, it could be that uh, the things are just not uh, worth taking in. I know that's not respectful of older people and their treasures. Treasure is a word I think we should ban from our vocabulary. Um, <laughs> But, and the other thing is the children have not lived among these things the way the, that the elders have. And they maybe don't appreciate or understand um, where, the, where the, for example, the painting hung in the house and why it hung there, for example. 
Um, and there's, a, there's another reason though, which it just doesn't time out well in the aging of the uh, older generation and the younger generation. If you're moving at 75, your kids are what, perhaps 50 years old. They've got houses that are fully furnished already and they don't really need other things. I, people, I think people offer them out of a sense of obligation um, to see that there, if, if there isn't something that somebody would like, but they always conclude the kids don't take much. Um, right, right. Now, in the book, you say, maybe go to the next generation, maybe grandchildren. Yeah. Um, right. Who are more, who are aged more appropriately for starting grand, out. Exactly. The granddaughter is moving to an apartment or um, it was occurring to me that, that probably if, if we're taking in more migrants soon, as a result of world crises and migrations of people around the world, more people are going to suddenly need setting up of housekeeping. And um, that would perhaps be an outlet for things like this. Um, I have a, but I have a suggestion for adult children, which is that um, when um, somebody is in gear and downsizing, you don't show up and you say, well, Ma, that's not my style. I don't like to decorate with avocado or, um, well, Ma, I already have something like that. My advice is just shut up and take it. Because the gift, the real gift here is the acceptance. Of, the gift is the, the generosity is the acceptance of the gift. Opening your arms wide when somebody is offering something is very, very important. You're affirming the giver and you're creating that bond through the gift. So my advice is shut up and take it and take some more. I think that is excellent advice. And um I, I couldn't agree more after having downsized both my parents and being a baby boomer myself. Absolutely. You know, I thought it was funny when we were downsizing my parents' house after they both passed away. You know, I took a, we took a ton of pictures and sent them around. And it was really, truly the grandchildren who, and you know what was interesting um, is they chose, they wanted return to them gifts that they gave my parents. Mm. It was interesting. And, it, and a lot of things weren't necessarily appropriate for their age stage in life like they were for my parents as the recipients of those gifts. A lot of like figurines and stuff like that. But it was just, it's sweet that they sort of wanted what they gave mm. to yeah. the older adult, you know, the, uh, back. So that's kind of cute. Therefore reaffirming that tie, refreshing that tie. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah. but um, I agree a hundred percent, just take it and do with it what you will, but good Lord, validate the older adults keeping of that gift and then giving it to you. Yes. And they know what you're going to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> or I, it's on you. It's on you to do what they can't. Exactly. Do. And they don't even really care, I think at that point, but in an article in the New York Times several years ago, you noted that family members who help with downsizing fall into two categories generally. They assist or they assert. I love the way you said that. You say you've seen adult children discarding stuff behind a parent's back, figuring it won't be needed. And then you go on to say you've seen older adults retrieve things from the garbage afterward. There's exasperation and hurt feelings, you say, and it creates sour memories. So that kind of goes along with what we were just discussing, but talk about that, they assist or they assert. Well, and, and most, of, most move stories have adult children in there somewhere. We're kind of surprised when we know that there are adult children and they're not in the story. Um, we don't follow up on that, but um, that's an interesting piece of the story that's missing. Some just stand by saying, you can't tell your mother what to do. Um, I'll just, I'll do what she, her bidding, if she wants to do this, I'm okay with that. But I think when, when the couple or the individual is moving is older, is less capable, perhaps becoming frail, um, adult children show up with more uh, business on their minds. We're going to get down to this, we're going to do this, because, and, and it's, not, it's not out of meanness, it's to protect, it's to ensure the safety and security of the older person. Um, one woman had caught her father putting pots and pans in the trunk of his car 
and she and she took them out and said he doesn't need any pots and pans and, and it isn't just she disrespects her father it's just that there's a lot to do and there's a short time to do it and um, we don't have time to fool around here and so people actually might throw things out in the kitchen uh, that or 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 just trash things behind their back well, and that's what a lot of senior move managers tell us, that that's where, you know, just this kind of description of this family situation is why so many people are, are looking to senior move managers as sort of an impartial expert advisor, where um, the family can be the family rather than the, the tough taskmaster. Mm -hmm. They can be the loving daughter who gently guides the mom and dad, you know, through this process rather than being the drill sergeant. And, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to be both. It's impossible to be both. So sometimes having that expert impartial um, third person is, is always a benefit. Is, you is, might, is tough love an occupational requirement for uh, <laughs> administering tough love for a move manager? Well, it's funny because we really pride ourselves on actually a more compassionate approach than maybe a family member would be. And I think some of your research would, would underscore that. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's just, don't forget many family, most families are doing this once or twice at most three times in their lifetimes, you know, downsizing a parent. I'm, I'm putting three times in there just as a general because uh, in-laws and, and parents. So they're not necessarily expert at it, whereas our senior move managers can tell families what they see, what they observe, what their solutions are to the problems, because there's a lot of consistency across this, where, you know, similar situations are encountered pretty much, you know, all the time. Sure, you're going to have the, the unusual situation occasionally, but there is a rhythm to this. And to have someone who does it, you know, day in and day out mm -hmm. versus having, you know, you know, it's almost unfair to everybody. It's unfair to that adult daughter who's put in the position of taskmaster because there's a deadline approaching or whatever. And it's certainly unfair to the um, to the mom who is watching her entire life, you know, be processed before her eyes. So it's all good. In an article in the New York Times several years ago, oh, sorry, that was the same question. Um, you write in your book that people you interviewed were surprised at how daunting physically and mentally um, downsizing was. But you write that the most common stressor was the clock ticking, the deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot. There's just so much people, the typical span that people had, we asked, and then we asked for confirmation to, you know, tell us back about it. Repeat that, please. Um, something between six and six weeks and three months um, was the span of time to cut the quantity of your possessions in what half or maybe even more. Um, it's daunting, and all of these decisions that have to be made, and all this list making. People talked about losing sleep. Um, really, they talk about their sleep being disrupted, waking up in the middle of the night. And they saw the list just growing longer in front of them. They go to bed and the list hadn't been accomplished. Um, and the deadline is bearing down on them. That's, I think, was particularly stressful, which why, is why it would argue for uh, doing, uh, divesting long in advance, far in advance, um, so that you have time and it's controlled um, and it's, and it's not, and not so difficult for you. Now, I know it's not in human nature to do that. And there's probably a good reason sometimes for waiting until the last minute. Um, but it really, people said, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. For sure, for sure. It's I the know. hardest thing I've ever done. I've ever done. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, it, for sure. Um, well, we are seeing um, a bunch of questions here. So I have a few more myself, but we're just going to have to ask you back and get you out of retirement again, because I know we've got some really good questions here. Some of them are a little long, but I just want to um, thank you from our, our end of this, that um, we really are so grateful for making that acquaintance uh, in 2009 for um, your work in our field. We just... Um, you know, we think it has really elevated what we do. We certainly believe in it, but your research and, and certainly your book, which I encourage everyone to read, 
um, is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really good um, review of all of the things that make up, you know, later life downsizing. And it's, you know, we're all, as we age, we're all going to be faced with this. So we can look at it, you know, academically, personally, professionally, but it is, um, it's, it's sort of a, a common denominator for all of us. And if we're, you know, we, we sort of do the practice run on our loved ones, our parents, our in-laws, our aunts and uncles and grandparents, but we all are going to have our own reckoning with our, as you call it, our material convoy. Um, Workside NASM celebrates our 20th anniversary this year. Congratulations. And, yeah, it's very exciting. And, um, you know, the future is really bright for this because there's 70 million baby boomers, uh, you know, going through um, the process of later life right now. So. And 60% of them say that they have too many things. Yay. Uh, based based yeah. on our polling elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. So think about the size of that market. My goodness. I know. It's, and our members are telling us that most of the calls they're getting, re, you know, recently are not from 82 year old Mrs. Jones. It's from 55 year old Mrs. Smith that the clients are actually getting younger. So perhaps those of us in this field getting the word out about do this earlier, you know, yes. um, to make it a little easier on yourself. And we now we have the model of our parents because they were, you know, they more of them lived longer, more of them got jammed up with their possessions in their houses. And we, we observe that. So that's been a model for us as well. So uh, things are evolving. Thank goodness. All right, Jennifer, do we have some questions? All right, I'm gonna just start I'm with- I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we do. We've got some questions. They are kind of chunky. Um, so um, from Cheryl McSherry uh, in the New York City metro area, she says, I do see younger folks still wanting things on a wedding registry, but the younger generations seem to get rid of stuff very easily. Is this something you agree with? They are not collectors generally. I can't, I can't comment. Again, we have no technology for for assessing this uh, a lot of people have opinions and that may be correct about their um avidity uh their or their uh how quick they are to uh release things from their material convoys as i say but we don't know how to assess this okay all right this is a, a bit of a lengthy question um it's from our member cameron early who is in, with golden years home transitions in australia he says he's really struggling with a recently widowed male client who doesn't really want to move from his home and location, but the memories of his late wife in his home is the sole driver for his desire to move. He has good health and mobility, is only 72. He is very grounded to the local community through clubs, family, and so forth. He has substantial financial means and could potentially live actively for another two decades or so. We've been encouraged him to allow our team to completely remodel his home with fresh furnishings rather than physically moving him. In 10 years of helping clients downsize and move, we really haven't ever encountered a job task quite like this before. Have you uh, any thoughts or suggestions in respect to how we should approach this task? The very first person that we ever interviewed uh, ever uh, turned out to have been an estate seller. This is astonishing. She knew the, the value of everything in her house. And she um, did, when she downsized and moved as then as a widow, um, she sold everything. She got an astonishing figure uh, money from these things. But she said she, she and her husband had furnished that whole house, had bought things together. And she said, it just hit me the last night. It just, I was just overwhelmed that we, all these things we bought together, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't handle it anymore. I had to move away from him. She moved from the house because he was in that house in, in every respect, in all of that furniture. I had to move away from him. And it sounds, this gentleman is not um, moving, but at least he is moving away from the things that perhaps are too full of memories. And so refurnishing the house sounds something like what this woman went through. Uh, from Janine Bryant, uh, 
in Nebraska. As you know, Dr. Eckert, I'm a huge fan. This has been such an interesting discussion. One of the most aggravating kinds of items to me are plaques, trophies, and frame certificates. Coming from the world of academia, you no doubt have acquired a ton of these kinds of things. Have you ever broached the subject with KU? Can we stop the madness of engraved plaques? I, you, you can't see, but I've got a wall of them over here. Um, <laughs> actually, they, they mean less as time goes by, but yes, that seems to be a convention of, of giving people plaques and, and mementos and things of that sort. And when you go home, where are they all going? They're, you're bringing home a lot of things to dust eventually. All right, here's a, here's that's a good that's a good comment. Yeah, that's a that's a category. Well, this is a whole actually a whole conversation about when you cease working, when you retire. Now we're bringing the two strains together. Do you bring things home? Some of us bring nothing home from the office except perhaps a few pictures, but some of them have a lot of material to bring home from the office, and it can cause complications at home. <laughs> Are you speaking from experience there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. All right. Here's another one. I love your book. One question. I have always persuaded my female clients to keep their wedding dresses. Most of have wanted to donate or discard it, but I've always encouraged them to keep it for future generations, even just a piece to use in their own wedding gowns. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts? Am I wrong? I think that's a sweet idea. No, I, I, I think that's a wonderful idea. Okay. You're, you're, you, would be, you would remember your wedding dress forever. Um, some people you know, remember their wedding dresses as a struggle because they had to fit into it or they bought it six months before the wedding and then uh, they didn't quite fit into it by the time the wedding came around or they didn't like it or stepped on it at the reception. But to have that part of um, your family heritage on that special day, I, I think that's such a sweet idea. All right, one, another one. Uh, what do you feel uh, about how people who are purchasing items on online estate sales and then putting them in storage seems like it's just feeding hoard, hoarding in some ways? Uh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Um, all right, Dr. Hurt, can you recommend a professional course that covers the scientific issues of aging and memory? I am doing more and more work in assisted living and particularly I'm called to work with individuals with no family whatsoever. These are very challenging moves. Thank you for a great presentation today. There are 33 Alzheimer's disease research centers in the United States um, and most of them in, are in, in large uh, cities. If there is a major medical center near you or a major hospital near you, they always have an edu a public education function or a public education unit where people can learn more about the disease because it's very puzzling to family members um, to think that they're perhaps confronting this. So um, I, I think a neurologist or a, a neurological practice at one of these places could help you with that. All right, uh, one more question. Uh, have you had the experience of downsizing yourself? If so, I'm curious to know if you were surprised by any additional insights from your own personal experience. I, this is a funny story. My wife and I took, over, took, took on one Saturday, a quarter of our basement. This is where all the boxes are stacked from the last time we moved 30 some years ago. In one box was all of my treasures. I don't like that word. All of my treasures from my high school and grade school years photographs and you know yearbooks and all of those things you know from your youth and I took the box out and I said I am going to have this is going to take a long time I don't know if it, when I open it I opened the box and it turns out either mice or chipmunks had been living in there had chewed up the photographs and had um, it was it, there were nuts in there and and droppings and it was a mess it was a total mess the whole thing took 90 seconds to box up and take it out and throw it in the backyard. Um, that was my experience and led me to wonder whether I could start a business that uh, loaned out uh, mice and chipmunks to people <laughs> in, order to, in order to ruin their things so that uh, it would make the downsizing easier. So more relief than sadness, huh? Well, 
My wife and I are currently uh, moving through, you know, those boxes of slides, slide carousels, trying to decide, trying to cut down the number of them. It's a vexing thing um, because they belong to my family, my brothers and sisters. It's their life, it's their history, it's their experience. Um, and I'm, I know you can pay to have them digitized. We're just moving through them. And then we have to turn to the 15 carousels that my wife and I accumulated about our own family. So this is vexing. <laughs> well, that's your retirement project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we just had a blast today. So glad we reconnected 13 years ago and uh, retired or not, we still want you in our orbit. And thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it and, and have a wonderful retirement. Well, we'll see you soon, I'm sure too. Thank you very much. Take care, bye.